Uh, ephemera, what is it and does it matter? Uh, the first question is quite easy to answer. Uh, my favorite definition is a transient document of everyday life. Once its original purpose has been served, you simply tear it up and throw it away. And the classic example of 21st century ephemera must be the zero fare bus ticket. How many people are going to keep one? And I can just imagine lecturers here in 200 years' time pondering the meaning and purpose of a zero fare bus ticket. The equivalent, of course, a couple of centuries ago, was the toll gate ticket, this particular one being uh, through Bermondsey, Rotherhive, and Deptford. Again, it's a tiny piece of paper, on very, very thin paper, and not many of them were kept. And that is why these documents are now so rarely seen. On the other hand, a decorative topographical print is not strictly ephemeral, since it was intended to be preserved, which can cause confusion when the same printing plate was used for two products. For example, the only way of telling a sheet of Victorian writing paper from a booklet of views sold to the tourist is the paper on which it was printed. Writing paper is thin enough to be folded and put into an envelope. Souvenir views are printed on porcelain card. This transient life helps to explain both why ephemera has tended to be ignored in academic circles and why I hope you will agree that those examples which do survive really can add to our understanding of their world. Ephemeral documents can be printed or manuscript, and of course a combination of both. And as, you have, as soon as you have a written element, you have an item which is really truly unique. With a few notable exceptions, such as the John Johnson collection at the Bodleian, which was created solely on the initiative, the, on the initiative of the eponymous curator, ephemera was simply not deemed to be worthy of preservation by institutions. The majority of those which have survived did so either because they were kept preserved by a family or they had a legal or financial reason for their preservation. For example, both the ownership and hiring of horses is something that used to be taxed. And the traveller was issued with a ticket to show that the tax duty had been paid. At each staging post on the road, the initial ticket was handed in and an exchange ticket was issued in its place. If a horse had been hired for more than one day, the charge for the second and subsequent days was not taxed, but was evidenced by the issue of an exemption ticket for the first stage, and at the second stage, this was replaced by a check ticket. Since the only the first ticket had a monetary value, the others tended to go into the dustbin. And that is, so far as I'm aware, the check ticket, the last, it's last ticket in the stage, exists only in proof form. And I'm not aware that a single check ticket has survived. It simply had no monetary value, no family interest, no legal value, and so wasn't kept. Ephemera has, of course, been around for as long as humans have needed to record information. And covering the centuries, let alone the globe, is no more practical for me today than it would have been for Jules Verne. So in the time that remains, I'm going to take a specific country, namely Great Britain, and a particular period of history, namely the Industrial Revolution, in which to try to demonstrate to you why more notice deserves to be taken of ephemera. I've chosen this aspect for a number of reasons. In the first place, the inspiration for this lecture was the immediate past provost, Sir Roderick Flood, whose future book on the economics of garden history will, I'm sure, take advantage of ephemeral sources. Secondly, the ephemera of the Victorian era is not only accessible, but it's also very visual, and it's a period of a country's history to which we can still relate. Finally, we are, of course, in the heart of the City of London, which has been at the centre of trade ever since Roman times. So although ephemera has a much wider scope, it is our mercantile history which forms the core of my talk today. Only last week, Sir Tim Berners-Lee was given the honorary freedom of the city, 
in recognition of his exceptional contribution to the information revolution and to the transformative effect which the web has had upon the world. But the Industrial Revolution also transformed the world for earlier generations. And it is my contention that without the relative speed and efficiency of the transfer of knowledge in Victorian England, then the course of change would have been much slower. When Philip Corsini arrived in London in the mid-16th century, the merchants of the time used to close off the end of Lombard Street with a row of chairs across the street in order to complete the day's business. By 1571, of course, Sir Thomas Gresham had opened the Royal Exchange so that information could be exchanged in rather more commodious surroundings. But it was not until 1635 that King Charles I made the Royal Mail available for use by the general public. The third report of the Select Committee of Postage in 1838 makes the point that the safe and speedy conveyance of letters for the benefit of trade and commerce was the primary consideration of the government on the first establishment of a general post office. The revenue which it was expected would arise was held to be of minor importance. From an early date, commodities had been priced in newspapers. But these tended to be weekly publications, and the availability of the same information to, to any reader offered little competitive advantage to individual traders. Hence the development of printed lists, or prices current, prepared by wholesalers and addressed to individual customers. Now, while such communications did not arrive in the instantaneous nature of an email, with up to 10 mail deliveries in London each day and a preferential delivery service for merchants in the city, a customer could receive information and act upon it within a single morning without even having to sort out the spam. The cost of sending an ordinary letter at this time was prohibitive for the bulk of the population. But in accordance with the government's initial intentions, Commercial information, such as prices current, could be sent free of postage by the clerks of the road in return for a modest perquisite from a subscriber. Here we see William Ogilvy, clerk of the North Road, offering mercantile intelligence to his subscribers in 1800, including, as you'll see in the bottom of the list, uh, Lloyd's List. But these were still general market lists, and it was not until 1837 that the Treasury authorised the posting of prices current for the heavily subsidised price of one penny, whether being sent inland or to the British Empire. This set the scene for Roland Hill's reforms of 1840, which established a uniform penny post rate and eliminated a system that charged both by weight distance, and the number of sheets of paper. Apart from the huge number of letters sent free of charge by members of both Houses of Parliament, usually having nothing to do with the reason for which they were allowed to send the mail, the illogicality of the system meant that it was significantly cheaper to send a letter from London to the wilds of Suffolk than it was to a manufacturing centre such as Glasgow. And it was actually the Court of Common Council of the City of London which led the way in campaigning for cheaper postage through the Mercantile Committee. And some 5,000 petitions were sent to Parliament in the three years leading to reform. Uh, those of you who want to learn more about this fascinating part of the story are encouraged to visit the exhibition at Guildhall Library next May, which draws upon the knowledge and experience of one of my colleagues one of my elected colleagues, the father of the House, Deputy Anthony Eskenzi. Establishment figures such as the Duke of Wellington and the Postmaster General Lord Lichfield were wholly opposed to any reforms, and being members of the House of Parliament, losing their, one of their main perks was not something they would countenance lightly. But at this time, it was estimated that five-sixths of letters sent from Manchester to Liverpool were carried privately 
in breach of a post office's monopoly. One Manchester business house told the committee of inquiry that <clears throat> we should consider the general reduction to a penny as one of the greatest boons that could possibly be conferred on the trading interest, a measure of almost equal importance but of greater safety than even the repeals of the Corn Laws. When postage rates were reduced even further, in, on, well, reduced to a, when postage rates were reduced as a temporary measure to fourpence on the 5th of December 1839, there was a striking 120% increase in internal correspondence within this country, which Disraeli observed constituted a revolution overnight in thoughts and attitudes. On the 10th of January 1840, postage was dramatically reduced still further to one penny, and the volume of chargeable letters rose from 75 million in 1839 to 270 million three years later and 327 million by 1846. While the financial impact upon the postal revenues was much debated at the time, the benefit to commercial enterprise was undeniable. A wholesale grocer reported to the 1843 Committee of Inquiry that his correspondence had quadrupled, his credits had shortened, his payments were quicker, and his, order, his orders more numerous as a result of these reforms. While Pickford & Co, the carriers, testified that they had sent eight times the number of letters in 1842 than they had in 1839. By 1850, no fewer than 500 prices current were registered for the General Post Office to ensure that they could be sent across the Atlantic for one penny, as opposed to one shilling for an ordinary letter. As Sir Tim Berners-Lee said, said last week, the reforms to the postal system created connectivity in a comparable way to the World Wide Web. And I would suggest that this revolution is reflected in contemporary ephemera. Prior to 1840, much of a finely engraved commercial correspondence emanated from retailers supplying the high-end domestic market. Since documents such as invoices would normally be sent with the goods, there was no added cost of postage and consequently was of less importance to them that a significant part of the paper was taken up with printed images or text. After 1840, with a burgeoning middle class and a much cheaper means of communicating with them, marketing became the priority. While we may think of smoking chimneys as a pollutant, uh, particularly in a Chinese context at present, 150 years ago, we were in much the same position. Smoke was a symbol of activity and therefore of prosperity. There was certainly an abundance of smoke issuing from every orifice of Moorfield's tile and pipe manufactory near Kilmarnock in 1850. The letter, incidentally, is seeking new railway sidings from the Glasgow and South Western Railway, railway to serve a new factory they were building. Artistic license undoubtedly played a part, elevating aspects such as railway engines so that they appear more dominant from their surroundings, and even inserting canals where none existed in the vicinity. How the images of factories, workers and products are often the only visual image that remains. And the jobbing artists seem to have made a, a reasonable job of portraying the day-to-day -day people on objects with which they were familiar. Murdoch, Aitken and Company's letter of 1853 is handsomely decorated with symbols of their enterprise as befits a supplier of railway wagon weighing machines to Glasgow Station. Similarly, there is little reason to doubt the accuracy of the Hawthorne engine on their notification in 1850 that two railway engines have been supplied to the Glasgow and South Western Railway. Pride in the product was an attribute of many a Victorian industrialist, as expressed visually 
in the images of medals one at the industrial exhibitions which proliferated in the, in the second half of the 19th century. Joseph Curran's fire bricks made in Newcastle won such an award at the Great Exhibition of 1851, and you can see both sides of a medal of either side of this invoice, which no doubt contributed to them winning orders in North America, where a scion of a family, John Curran, visited the Providence Gas Works in 1850, 1860, I beg your pardon, and was soliciting orders. As the years progressed, many industrial buildings were adapted for other uses. Alton Mill had begun life in 1734, making brass and copper wire, but by 1775 had become a paper mill, as did the Eagle and Alder mills in Tamworth, which took advantage of the growing volume of textile waste, which arose from the mechanization of that industry. I suspect that the mill did not look quite as impressive in reality, uh, since Charles Fisher employed only 24 men at the time that this invoice was written. In the 1790s, John Hives and Joseph Atkinson, Moses Atkinson, rebuilt the woolen and cotton mill at Bank Mills in Leeds for manufacturing linen yarns. And their activity is evidenced by this extensive price list of 1841, offering five different qualities of yarn to a firm of table linen manufacturers in Dunfermline. By 1833, bank mills had become a very sizable enterprise, the building consisting of six stories in a 20-bay block. And this expansion from cottage industry to factory is borne out by two invoices from Britannia Foundry in Bedford, the upper one being in 1838, which is more of a sort of cottage industry factory, and the lower one of 1870 being much more the industrial enterprise of the later Industrial Revolution. The interiors of such enterprises seldom feature. Uh, perhaps they were too redolent of dark satanic mills. And Samuel Walker was quite unusual in showing the processes involved in the manufacture of wire and tubing namely the wire mill, which is at the left of this picture, the rolling mill, the tube mill, and the annealing muffle. The combined art of the engraver and of the engineer are best actually seen in the trade cards printed in Belgium in the mid-19th century. This form of iridescent printing, in which Belgium specialised, relied upon the use of mercury powder. Uh, so the method died along for printers. Uh, but that, as they say, is a subject which could take up another entire lecture. Ephemera, therefore, allows you to see the processes involved. Here we see, in the top image, pigments being ground for paint in Macclesfield in 1825. In the lower left slide, we can see what well-dressed people were wearing in 1819. The well-dressed lady on the right and the cobbler offering her a very well-made booty on the left-hand side. And we can see what the well-dressed shop window looked like in Maryport. We can even see exactly the same materials that they did, since samples were often sent by post to prospective buyers. And being enclosed in a letter, they have survived as pristine as the day they were made. Accurate and timely information of commodity prices was of huge importance to a successful trader. And we are fortunate that such information tended to be filed rather than being destroyed. And so, even when made redundant by the next edition, the ephemeral evidence survived or at least it tended to do so until the impact of future wars and of commercial reorganization and of space saving and modern technology lent to it being thrown in the bin. 
So what can we learn from such apparently mundane documents? As is evident from the fact that you can't read the detail of Sanford's Merchants and Planters Price Current of 1851, this single sheet of folded paper is packed with about as much information as it was possible to cram in. Being printed in Mobile, Alabama, it is scarcely surprising that cotton features highly. And the predominance of Great Britain, and indeed of Liverpool, is evidenced by the export figures, showing that over half of all cotton exported from Mobile was shipped to Great Britain, with Liverpool accounting for over 85% of United Kingdom imports. The list provides similar statistics for nine of the principal cotton exporting ports in the United States, in addition to our market review since the last edition a week earlier. From that market re review, we learn that news of the latest depressed prices in Liverpool had been carried to New York on the US mail steamer Arctic and then telegraphed down to Mobile Telegraphs are another instance of how communications in this era transformed the world, leading the merchant to remark that cotton selling has been a dire and disagreeable business this week. There having been a demand only on one day, there has also been an advance in freights, that's freight costs, which is unfortunate at this time. But even typesetting took up time, valuable time when you were trying to catch the next mail steamer across the Atlantic. And the Victorians were extraordinarily innovative in making devices to enable facsimile printing, often in the language of the country to which the price list was being sent. A typical example is Bush & Co's Cotton Circular of 1852, <clears throat> written by a clerk in German the transmission to that market, and then reproduced in facsimile form by a Liverpool printer. I guess the only drawback for the recipient was trying to decipher the handwriting on poor quality, lightweight paper, which was necessitated by continental postal rates, generally rising above each quarter ounce, whereas in this country they rose above each half ounce. Another commodity upon which the Industrial Revolution depended was coal. And while the coal mines themselves are but a distant memory, their evidence lingers on in ephemeral survivors. The London Coal Exchange set prices three times a week. And in 1801, lists no fewer than 64 collieries in Newcastle and Sunderland. In 1700, more than 40% of the coal mined in Great Britain was extracted from the Northeast, at a time when British pits were producing about 3 million tonnes per annum, rising to 30 million tonnes by 1830, 75 million tonnes by 1855, and 100 million tonnes in 1865. The availability of such a relatively inexpensive energy source on such a scale underpinned the Industrial Revolution. And the interdependence of coal, iron, shipbuilding and chemicals is demonstrated by the map on Palmer Hall's striking price current of 1896, which also lists the freight charges per tonne to over 200 overseas ports on this single sheet of paper. Incidentally, the subsidy on commercial correspondence is evident from the halfpenny stamp compared to tuppence halfpenny, which would have been charged on a letter, an ordinary letter to Norway at this time. By contrast, the Welsh valleys were responsible for only 3% of national output in 1750 a proportion which had increased to 20% by 1913 
largely on the back of steam coal, which was highly valued by the Admiralty, and much improved infrastructure. In 1847, about 30% of Welsh coal was exported, and Matthew Wayne was the first to ship steam coal from the Aberdare Basin to Butte Docks by canal and from 1841 by the Taff Valley Railway. The use of the French language and the inclusion of a map of his coal mines with their connections to transport facilities was intended to communicate the preeminence of the company um, to the customer. The circular pattern of trade is, I'm sure, an aspect of business with which many of us are familiar, but which can again be illustrated by ephemera. As on the letter, this letter to Copenhagen in 1847, informing the recipient that 100 tons of furnace coal had been shipped to the Baltic from the tiny East Lovian port of Kokenzi, now more remarkable for the site of a coal-fired power station, ironically closed in 2013. But you can see from the image at the lower part of this letter how small the port of Kokenzi was, really barely existed. But just inland from Kokenzi is the town of Trenent, which, coming, being coming from Edinburgh myself and going to school in Dunbar, I remember driving through Trenent when there were actually coal mines working there. And the map shows the coal mine, the railway leading from Kokenzi port uh, to the collieries just south of Trenent. But having got to the Baltic, uh, the, the ship returned with a cargo of railway sleepers, which illustrated the, 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 the trade, one way going in coal and coming back with railway sleepers from the forests of, of, the, of Scandinavia, uh, with which the railways depended. Perhaps a less obvious form of, of barter is the five tons of cheese, uh, which were ordered by Bailey and Shaw a firm of leather dressers in Nottingham. And this invoice was sent to America with the cargo of skins shipped to New York in 1846. And it basically says that flour basically isn't worth now importing from North America because of flour prices. But they'd like a new, a new shipment of five tons of cheese uh, to replace the previous consignment, most of which had been thrown overboard uh, owing to rough seas on its back inward journey. The importance of coastal shipping before the railway network developed was vital for the transportation of heavier goods such as coal and paper. Paper mills consequently <clears throat> tended to be fairly dispersed across the country, really growing up wherever there was a textile industry, but the demand in London far exceeded local capacity, and the well-developed paper industry outside Edinburgh regularly shipped product to London, as is shown on this shipper's schedule of 1853, where the London, Leith, Edinburgh and Glasgow Shipping Company lists the ships which carried the paper to London the marks which would have been marked on the bales of paper, the size of the bales, and the cost of the freight. So that document uh, demonstrates a significant shape, trade just from one paper mill on the waters of Leith outside Edinburgh down to London. Canals, and then railways of course, transformed communications in the Industrial Revolution. But they also caused huge disruption. Henry Trotter uh, lived at Morton Hall, just outside Edinburgh in the 1840s. And the blue line across his sketch at the top of his letter <clears throat> shows the course of the North British Railway straight through his garden. And evidently he was not enough of a landowner 
either to have the railway diverted around his property or to have his own station built. He writes that on Friday, when we were settled at dinner, three men were discovered at the point where the poplar tree stands, alone in all its glory. And we were not long in making out that they were railway surveyors by the implements they carried. You may imagine we watched them narrowly from the windows. And I have drawn a blue line on the sketch to show where they went. Right through the fresh water pump, straight through the young wood, and then through the centre of the gooseberry bushes. The men said that was the best line if the railway went on, which of course it, it did. The social upheavals of the time can be relived vividly in eyewitness accounts on ephemeral documents, uh, such as this letter written from the Tredegar Ironworks in 1841. The writer, Mr. Blair, was evidently a trainee lawyer who had found work with a Catholic Whig attorney with a large common law practice in South Wales, who served also as town clerk and recorder of Newport. He reports that Chartism is smothered, but not extinguished. At a meeting called by the mayor of Newport to address the queen, all business was interrupted. Three groans given for the mayor and three cheers for Frost, Williams and Jones. F. O'Connor is coming here, they tell me. John Frost, Zephaniah Williams and William Jones have the dubious distinction of being the last people in Britain to be sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered for their role in leading the Newport Rising in November 1839. The sentence was actually later commuted to transportation for life by Lord Melbourne following a campaign led by Fergus O'Connor. The evidence of the repatriation of wealth is a frequent theme in ephemeral sources. James Mackey was a leading plantation owner and plantation and slave owner in Charleston, South Carolina. And in 1812, <clears throat> he sent back this bill of exchange for 565 pounds to his bankers in Edinburgh. Now that doesn't sound a lot of money today, but its current equivalent simply buying, by applying the percentage increase in the retail price index is 32,000 pounds. But if you factor in the economic power of that amount of wealth, this bill of exchange is worth 1,855,000 pounds. Such documents survive because owing to the hazards of piracy and shipwrecks, it was customary to send three copies of such potentially valuable documents back to this country. In this instance, the first copy was sent by the ship Lady Galatine, the second by the Savannah, and the third, which is this copy, by the Doris. As it happened, all three documents arrived safely, so this third copy was simply filed at the bank within its original letter, where it remained until I opened it 200 years later. The popularity of shares, buying shares in infrastructure and raw material businesses, knew few bounds, and lengthy lists of stock exchange prices proliferated printed on huge sheets of paper. While many of the more exotic ventures disappeared without trace, others such as the Mount Bischoff Tin Mining Company in Launceston, Tasmania, prospered sufficiently for dividends to be remitted back to their original shareholders. 
This particular one was, again, enclosed. This is a first bill of, this is a second bill of exchange. So that, again, would have been enclosed within its original envelope and left there because the first bill of exchange arrived safely. But not all wealth created by the Industrial Revolution was spent in such a constructive fashion. John Arkwright was the grandson of the more famous Richard Arkwright, and he used his fortune to buy Hampton Court, not the one near London, but in Herefordshire, which he remodelled in the 1830s, buying a huge quantity of Brussels carpeting from the original carpet warehouse in London Wall. This is actually the entrance to uh, what is now Carpenters, the Worshipful Company of Carpenters, which by coincidence happens to be in the ward that I represent in the City of London. Uh, but now they don't sell carpets there anymore. A uh, headline in the Financial Times on the 5th of September 1912 bemoaned the fact that bankers were crowding out the brewers and distillers, whereas bankers and brewers had previously been bracketed together as the two preeminent industries of the, century, of the country. Uh, it may not have escaped your notice that banking halls are now increasingly being turned over to wine bars and restaurants, <laughs> where most of the clientele at any one moment will be communicating with the world on electronic devices. So you could say the wheel has turned full circle. But I wonder what ephemeral evidence of such a change will survive into the next century. I was going to say we're only 50 minutes at my disposal, but I've done really quite well in terms of not overrunning my time. I've been able to only scratch the surface of such a vast subject. But I hope I've been able to convince you of the value of ephemera to the researcher trying to delve below the surface of published sources and mine the rich vein of untapped wealth that lies beneath. Now, wonderful though PowerPoint is, it doesn't really do justice to the more sizable documents of the Victorian era and even less so to the samples of Victorian materials, which I referred to earlier, which were enclosed within their letters. So for those of you with a few moments to spare, at the end of this lecture, after questions, I've put up a selection of the original documents in the two frames over there. So I hope you'll have time to take a look at the actual thing, which gives you, as I say, a much, a much better impression of the original ephemeral sources than even PowerPoint can do. So thank you all very much for, for listening, and I'd be delighted to take any questions which you have.